The following podcast is taken from a live broadcast on Inspire FM. Assalamu alaikum and welcome to the book club show on Inspire 105.1 FM. My name is Imrana Mahmood and today is the 5th of November. Um, we just passed 10 o'clock. Apologies for the slight delay in um, the start of the show, S- slight technical technical issues, and that can happen, as you know. Um, so we are in uh, the virtual studio today, but I'm really looking forward to talking to you about um, a fantastic book, and I'm joined by a wonderful guest. Um, but before that, I just want to say that I hope everyone has gotten used to um, the you know, the, all the timing since the daylight savings kicked in, because I know this happens every year, but for some reason, I still need time to, to adjust. I don't know how um, how you are as listeners out there, um, but the best thing is um, I enjoyed my half-term break. I hope everyone who had their break also did. Um, and the best thing I enjoy about Half term is being able to curl up um, on the sofa with a good book, which brings me on to our um, guest today, who is Masuda Snaith. And I'm going to do a quick introduction um, to um, Masuda and also talk about her book, The Things We Thought we knew. So uh, Masuda is a writer of novels and short stories. Her debut novel, The Things We Thought We Knew, was released in 2017 when she was named an Observer New Face of Fiction. Her second novel, How to Find Home, was chosen as a BBC Radio 4 book at at bedtime. She's the winner of the SI Leeds Literary Prize and the Bristol Short Story Prize back in 2014. Masuda has led creative writing workshops in universities, hospitals, schools and a homeless hostel and has worked as a writing mentor for a variety of writing organisations. So that is, I think, a really wonderful um, introduction to our author who we are talking to today. Um, And all of this, you'll be pleased to know is part of the Luton Literature Book Festival which is taking place this Saturday on the 9th of November. It's an all-day event absolutely packed so you've got um, a really wonderful adult program and a children's program so we're going to hear more of that on today's show. Um, So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to say good morning to Masuda. I hope you're there. So you're hi how are you this morning? (laughs) I'm okay, thank you. As you were talking about the daylight saving, it does really make such a difference, doesn't it? it just it yeah. knocks us. It happens every year, <laughs> twice a year, but yeah, it still yeah. knocks us. Yeah, I mean, it's such a valid point. It's actually twice, <laughs> twice a year, and I know, I know, it's so strange, <laughs> but. I hope I hope that you've kind of um, yeah yeah kind of adjusted and and stuff. But and thank you so much for for joining us on the show this morning as well. So I guess maybe just to to start off, can we um, hear a little bit about your involvement in um, the book festival on Saturday? And then we'll go into a little bit more detail about obviously um, one of your books obviously that you've written. You've written obviously more than one, but yeah, I think that might be a really great place to start. Yes, yeah, so I'll be um, uh, coming to the Luton Literature Festival for the first time on Saturday to do an interview with you, which will be lovely at 10 a.m. in the morning at the Hat Factory. And then I'll be leading um, and hosting a panel with the SI Leeds Prize finalists, which is the SI Leeds Prize is a prize for Black and Asian women who haven't been published before, um, which is I was part of and I won in 2014 and, and made, had a massive impact on me. So I think um, is a great prize. Um, and we'll have the finalists. So we will get to listen from them about their work, ha- uh, actually have some readings from them as well. Um, and we'll do a similar thing. I think we'll be talking about the things we thought we knew in our in our interview um, earlier in the day as well. Mm. Yeah, and I, I'm really looking forward to obviously meeting you in person. Obviously, this show we're doing uh, virtually at the moment. And, you know, I'm, I'm really excited about the event and, and just have obviously had the pleasure of, of reading your book as well um and just very quickly in terms of the program itself for the the festival i know there's kind of um 
an emphasis this this year on female orientated stories and authors um and why do you think and, and again even with the, the the characters in the books you know kind of centered around those stories as well why do you think maybe it's quite important that we are championing those those voices in those stories The interesting thing about, um, I think, books and women is actually the largest um, buyers of books are women. But I think sometimes we can get ignored mm. a little bit in, in the sense of women writers about our stories are sometimes called domestic and kind of trivialised. Uh, so I think it is good to, to champion um, women in general, but also the variety of stories we have and um, how it can, even though things have got better, it can still be difficult to to navigate the publishing industry as a woman. Mm. Yes, no, absolutely. And I think, you know, you're right. I think it's so important that we create, I guess, platforms to to make sure, yeah, that, that we're able to, uh, properly committed, I guess, we we'll talk about you know diversity you know I guess in all its in all its forms. Um, so then maybe coming on a little bit to um, your uh, book itself. So obviously I had the pleasure of reading the things that we thought we knew, um, and I thought you know it was such a really wonderful book to read. I think you know you write beautifully. It was really heartfelt. I think there's so many aspects of it that I think you know resonated with maybe with me or I definitely know that people I know you know would if they were to read it and I'm going to obviously recommend that they do read it would would um resonate with it so, um, as well um so why do you think you know because you tackle quite an important um topic you know which one of them for example includes health issues relate, related to like chronic pain which sometimes isn't really appropriately acknowledged you know and I guess why was it important for you to give voice to that particular um issue so it's really interesting how um novel ideas come to me so usually it's via a character and for me Ravine um who was the central character in the things we thought we knew came to me quite strongly as somebody who was cut off from the world and um, living in her council estate flat in, in Leicester, which is where I'm from, and I was brought up. Although I was born in Luton, I have to emphasise, <laughs> so I'm really looking forward to, to coming back. Um, but yes, yeah, so it became part of her world. And then when I looked into chronic pain specifically, and my husband's a physiotherapist, so that really helped, um, I was able to really investigate what that would be like to to essentially still be feeling pain long after an injury and having no real medical way of, of removing that pain mm. and so that's where it kind of began but when I then when it the book then got published and I, I had um, this lovely response from people who said they've never seen their 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 own condition represented in fiction before I realized how actually we don't see a lot of um, physical ailments or disabilities or the things that very much affect people's lives in literature or art um, so it wasn't intentional I wasn't intentionally trying to to go and try and voice although all my books do kind of voice voice um, the the unheard voices I like to explore those those voices but it wasn't intentional in, in that way but I, I again shows I think how important literature is for reflecting the vast variety of humanness there is in the world. Absolutely. And I think you do that really, you know, wonderfully, because I have to say, I don't think I've ever really read a book, you know, looking at that topic, you know, in particular, when we look at, look at kind of chronic um, pain and, and the way people are suffering, really, you know, I know people who um, are having to really manage that pain. And um, absolutely, I think, mm. you know, it's so important that people do feel seen in, in you know, in, in the books that they're reading. Um, now, um, you've, which is really wonderful, that obviously you are the winner of um, two kind of literary prizes, which is the um, Leeds Literary Prize and Bristol Short Story. So that was back in 2014. I'd like to know a little bit about what has your journey been like, you know, since then um, as a writer? So really that was, that was a pivotal moment. That was a pivotal year for me because before that I pretty much decided at the age of eight, I wanted to be a novelist by the way. So this is something I'd wanted for a really long time. Mm. And I, 
entered, I'd written lots, I'd entered into competitions. Um, I tried, you tried to write a novel, sent it to agents, didn't really get anywhere. Um, mm -hmm. So I just kind of kept on going. And then this book, The Things We Thought We Knew, I actually, the first version of it, I wrote when I was 16 years old. It was my first attempt at writing a novel. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying it was any good, but I, I had a go at writing a novel at that age. And then mm -hmm. when I came to my 30s, I'd already had a go at writing a couple of other novels that didn't quite work. And I thought, I looked back at that draft, which was just in a thick notebook. I'd not even like typed it up. And I read it and I thought, I really love these characters still. And I love the the environment, which is set on a council estate, which I was brought up in. So there, there wasn't much research to do in that respect. So I still felt a good connection, but I was I didn't live there anymore. So I had a little bit of distance. Um, so I had another go at, at writing that from scratch and then sent that out um, to various competitions. So that SI Leeds, um, prize where I eventually won or but just being shortlisted was amazing to be honest mm. um was just a big validation for me that I was actually doing the right thing that I wasn't crazy to think that I could be a, a, a writer and an author mm. um and again with the the Bristol short story prize I, I was writing for so long so, so many different pieces and I love short stories because in between drafts of novels, it's something that you can get done in a relatively, I mean, it still takes time, but a relatively mm. short amount of time, which doesn't feel like it's gonna take you years, <laughs> which a novel mm. can. So I, I do love writing short stories as well. So to get that in the same year, it was a fact, I think within two weeks that I found out I'd won mm. both of those, just amazing. It was just what I needed to, to not give up. And so that led to me getting an agent, that led to me getting my book deal, um, so really, it made all the difference. You know, that's so wonderful to hear. So um, my daughter, who just recently turned 13, and she also uh, wants to be um, a writer. And and I kind of do that s a completely similar thing and encouraging her to, um, you know, submit her stories to, to different um, different kind of competitions. And, you know, she's been shortlisted Um actually alhamdulillah this is the second time for the young some writers award and i know how happy she was and you're right i think you know at a young age um to encourage reading but then also i guess for those that are interested in in, in writing to yeah really encouraging it and absolutely kind of you know can understand like you said what a pivotal moment that would have been for you um and now obviously the most amazing thing is you're born in luton and you're coming back to luton on saturday for the Luton uh, Literature Book Festival um, and I guess so just maybe a, a little bit there's a question I have you know around that obviously it's really important that um, I think anyway that we have festivals which obviously cater both for um, kind of adult readers or young readers um, so the other thing is so for example obviously I've got like I said, young teens, and we're in an age of social media. And obviously, as a mum, I think that's a big distraction. <laughs> so I'm constantly like, turn that off and, you know, read a book. Um, do you think literature festivals can kind of help maintain that love of reading and books, you know, it's in, in this kind of age of social media? I, I think the thing is with social media, obviously, it has its light and dark sides. And the mm -hmm. light part of it for, for book readers is that you can you know, get, see an author on Instagram and see what their life is like. You can watch videos mm -hmm. about them talking about craft in a far more accessible way. But mm -hmm. the thing that you don't get, which I think you do get in in live, live, um, even if it's live, live stream, but in, definitely in person events, mm -hmm. is to actually see the author and, and to ask your questions. And it just has a completely different atmosphere like I that's how I really started is I went to as many events as I could that had author events um, around me because I just wanted to absorb everything mm -hmm. and also then you can maybe even talk to them at the end and get a book signed it's it's all the excitement of being in a live event that you can't mm -hmm. get as you say when you're just staring at a phone which mm -hmm. I think the, the weird thing about social media is it, it's not very social it's mm -hmm. it's you alone looking at a phone well going out and being part of an event, it just makes you feel more a part of, of everything that's happening. 
Yeah, and no, I absolutely 100% echo it. I think there definitely isn't a feeling of, of being in person with authors. And like you said, yeah, just being able to ask questions, definitely a big plus with book signing. There's so much <laughs> excitement around um, getting your book signed. And yeah, just having that one-to-one -one conversation, you know, just for even if it's for a brief moment, which I think is really, really lovely. Um, and obviously the fantastic thing about the Luton Literature Book Festival is that they do have stories covering, you know, so many different themes, which include um, kind of historical drama, crime solving, uh, mystery, family, intergenerational relationships. There's so much, you know, that, that people, I guess, can have access to. And like you even said, absolutely, of course, there's a, you know, there is always a plus side to, to social media. Um, and obviously, the great thing about Saturday is that obviously people can attend in live, but there are also hybrid events that people can um, attend, you know, kind of um, as in watch live streams and um again you know we talk a lot about accessibility the fact that actually on the the festival on on saturday they are kind of low cost and um free events i think majority of the author talks are four pounds each um and uh i think even for the children um the the, the children's kind of uh program you can get one free accompanying adult ticket for you know the, those as well which is you know fantastic um so you know again there's there's so much happening um on saturday there's also a uh local authors and illustrators fair featuring local talent so like you said i guess it is a really good way of just immersing yourself in the world a kind of a books and, and literature um what about if there's anybody there who's like mm, well i don't really read much or i'm not sure if it's my thing um what might you say to encourage them to attend I think the, the, this is what I love about the festival, everything you've just said, it's accessible for so many different people, you can access it in different ways. Um, it's that live feeling of, of, of being in a venue where there's lots of people um, who are excited about something. And I think if, if reading isn't for you, if it's not something that you, you're you're big on, I think it, it, it might still be really interesting to come and hear someone talk about um, their experiences of reading or, or being a writer or um they even if you're coming for your kids mainly <laughs> you want your kids mm -hmm. to get involved in it I, I would encourage um the parents to come and and see see if there's anything for them because I think there's always a book for for every um person and if if you're up for reading it um so I think yeah just explore and there is so much on offer this um Saturday with events you know all through the day at, at, at the Hat Factory and Luton Central Library um, that I just think it will be a really lovely thing to be part of just come along and see see if it is for you and, and, and I love the fact that it's low cost as well because that was very very important to me growing up we, we had very little money we were up on a council estate um, single parent mother so those free events or those low cost events meant that I had access to 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 writers like uh, I'm living in Leicester I really didn't have a lot of access to mm -hmm. to writers or to the publishing industry so to, to, if people came and they came to library events or they came to festivals um I, I would grab that because mm -hmm. that that was such a rare opportunity yes exactly I think it definitely is you know we're, we're really lucky that we've got like a f festival which is you know I think this is now the, oh god I should know this is it the second or the third year but either way I mean it's, it's been you know really fantastic event and um we'll be, we'll be going to uh a uh, break soon um but just a quick question just before that is how do you feel about coming back to Luton what are you most looking forward to on on Saturday well, this, I am actually very excited. <laughs> I don't know why I'm sounding so surprised about that, but it has been many years. So I moved to Leicester when I was six, but we still came and visited family in Luton till probably my late teens. But it's been a good 20, 25 years, I would say, since I've actually been had a really good reason to come back to, to Luton. Um, so I'm really excited to see what it's like now because my main memory is, if I'm being very honest, is concrete. <laughs> I'm sure that's inaccurate. I've been told by the festival leaders that that this it's very different now, and yes. I, I'm going to go and visit the shopping. But apparently, that's all changed. So I'm really excited about seeing mm -hmm. Luton again, of, of being part of that community. It's always got a place in my heart. That's fantastic. So we're just going to go an ad break, and we'll carry on the conversation in a few moments. Assalamualaikum.
Assalamu alaikum, this is Atif Nawaz. Listen to Inspire FM shows in your time by heading over to inspirefm.org or listen on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. But the things that we thought we knew, which is the particular book we are talking about today. And this is in the context of the Luton Literature Book Festival, which is taking place on Saturday, 9th of November. We have lots going on at this event. So we were discussing some of that in the first half of the show. You've got four different author events, which I have the pleasure of facilitating so I'm really really looking forward to it um so those four author events so of the of course include um Masuda but also there is Jasmine Elmer who is the author of Goddess with a Thousand Faces there is Michael Stewart who is the author of Blackwood Women and we also have Eva Verde who has written In Bloom so you've got four different author events so absolutely looking forward to um, interviewing um, the authors talking about their books and just about their writing journeys. Um, Masuda also um, mentioned in the first half of the show that she will be leading a panel discussion with the SI Leeds Literary Prize authors so again that's really really um, something to to, I think, you know, to join and hear from different authors all in one space, which I think is a fantastic opportunity. Um, we also mentioned there's a lo- local author illustrator fair. So that, uh, so the author events are taking place at the Hat Factory. Um, however, the fair is taking place at Luton Central Library, and that is from 9.30 to 4.30 um, p.m. And it's a free entry, no need to book, you can just drop in, <clears throat> which is really, really um, fantastic. Again, because we were talking about affordability and accessibility, the fact that the events, most events are um, only four pounds. If for the children's program, uh, adults can actually get a, a kind of um, an accompanying ticket or if you were a carer as well. Um, so there's lots going on. There's also different types of workshops as well. So we can talk a little bit about that a bit later on. But for the time being, I'm going to invite Masuda back on um, line and talk a little bit more about her book, The Things That We Thought We Knew. Um, So my next question for you, um, Masuda, is basically you explore, um, as well as like different things, there's also a mother-daughter relationship in um, your book and whilst I was reading I felt you know you kind of included this disconnect which the main protagonist Ravine feels to her mother tongue um and obviously that I think their relationship as mother daughter um it's obviously it's there's you there's complexity to it which I think you know is is true for any sort of relationship we have um but why was it important for you to kind of have this aspect uh, within the novel Really, it's because that was my experience. So I was born in Luton and and stayed there till I was six and we had lots of family around. So I I know that if I'd stayed, if we if my mother hadn't left my father, which she did, Mm. um, I would be fluent in Bengali now. But Mm. because we then moved to Leicester and a predominantly white council estate, which is quite um, a thing because Leicester is very diverse. But we happen to be in one area that really wasn't that diverse. I kind of lost the language and it was because of that thing, I think, especially in the kind of 80s and 90s, where like having a different language, I don't think was very mm-hmm. valued within society. Well, well now, if I if I work with children and they are multilingual, I'll very much say, me, keep speaking <laughs> the different languages because it's so valuable. Um, so I, I, I kind of lost the ability to speak fluently in Bengali and it kind of does cause me a little bit of pain that that I can understand it quite well but I can't speak fluently and I think it probably caused my mum pain as well I mean the, the way we worked at home was that she would speak Bengali and we'd speak English back so we just lost that ability to 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 speak fluently and that's kind of what's reflected in the book is that Ravine, like her mum really wants her, to, you know, she sings a Bengali lullabies to her, the national anthem, she really wants her to, to maintain mm. her language, but but Ravine kind of loses it, it's uh, um, out of stubbornness almost, <laughs> mm. uh, and and yeah, so that's where that came from, it, it, and I'm, I'm, I guess the disconnect between uh, the immigrant, the first generation um, immigrants and their children, and, and, and having to adapt to a new to a country where, like I say, 
having different a different language especially at that time wasn't particularly valued it was kind of another thing to to be like oh you're different um so yeah that's where that came from specifically yeah and I, mean, I guess i just want to you know say thank you for for kind of including that because i think there's so many people that would definitely you know how you um are saying who her children of, of immigrants who would probably really relate to that and um i mean i know i'm kind of struggling to pass on um like we speak Urdu, well, I say we, yeah, I mean, I, you know, me, my mum was very strict in that sense when we were growing up, then only for Urdu to be spoken mm -hmm. at home. And, but actually, you're right. I think at the time it was like, oh, I just resent this. Like, oh, I can't just, you know, just be yeah. English so much easier because you're right. You know, once you go to school, and yeah, I mean, you, you just get used to the, the, the language, I guess, of, of the, the place you, you live. But I, I don't know that there's so much, I know that's quite loaded yeah. and, and there's so much to say on that but but the fact that now as a mother I really do want my children to to be able to to speak it and, and the struggle <laughs> that, that comes with that and so I, I think you know it was really you know you you wrote I think you wrote about it quite you know in a, in a delicate way but really from Ravine's point of view which I think was quite helpful and and I know obviously you mentioned earlier that um you obviously started writing the first draft so to speak when you were still a teenager which I think is you know amazing and and how wonderful for you to have gone on a journey and, and have it you know actually um kind of published um but how do you think the like what kind of feedback have you had from from readers because the book is written from a young person's point of view because um I thought that was quite interesting as well Um, I think that again, the reason that I chose that um, particular perspective, actually, in that in my first draft when I was sixteen, it was very much focused on the child. So it's, it's split in two. This book, so we've got Ravine as an adult um, at, at eighteen years old, and then she's mm -hmm. reflecting back on uh, her childhood growing up mm -hmm. on the estate. And originally, that first draft was mainly focused on her childhood. Mm -hmm. um, but in the redraft when i came back to it in my 30s i focused a little bit more on her being 18 and i think 18 is that age where you're technically an adult <laughs> but really mm. you don't have all the knowledge that that comes with being an adult and for Ravine in particular she's she's in a state of arrested development because she can't really leave her room she's suffering with chronic pain she's in her mother's flat she doesn't have any prospects of getting a job because she didn't do particularly well in her GCSEs because of the pain. So she's in that point of life where you're told that you're, you, you're an adult now, you can go and do adult things. And she really can't. She, she's, she's in an impossible situation. Uh, and I really wanted to explore that coming of age uh, mm -hmm. um, narrative of like that, that point when you're 18, early 20s, where you're really learning who you are. And hopefully that's where the journey you go on throughout the novel is by the end, she, she knows a little bit more about who she is and, and what she is capable of. Yeah, I mean, the things we thought we used definitely, you know, it, it would be a good way to describe a, a coming of age um, story. And um, I think what was one of the interesting things quite early on in the book is that, um, if I remember correctly, Ravine's gifted like a, a journal or she has something where, you know, her mum's encouraging her to kind of write her her thoughts down. And I thought actually that's, again, really interesting because obviously for yourself as a writer, but I guess just generally, like you said, at that age, you know, and, and especially in current times where young people really do suffer from, um, you know, you, you get different mental health um, issues that young people are suffering from and really, you know, trying to manage, I guess, the world that they live in when there's so much going on around them. Um, so I guess there's kind of two bits to that question. Like, number one, what is your own creative process, uh, creative writing process like? And what advice would you give to maybe younger people who um, might want to try out journaling or, or even writing stories? So I, I have always journaled kind of sporadically throughout my life. Um, when I was younger, I used to write to my imaginary cat, <laughs> which oh. uh, like write her letters um, telling her about mm -hmm. my life. Um, 
so that's kind of that but I, I kind of that's an interesting in terms of like relating that to creativity for, for me that, that that was just me getting stuff out but in terms of creativity and, and writing fiction pieces I do sometimes try and get to a character because if I want to get to know a character a bit get them well I say get them it's me but mm. to just get them to tell me what they mm. think and I'll just write it out kind of free flow to hear their voice because obviously I'm quite aware of my own voice mm. um and so I want to, to to hear what the difference is and I think journaling can really help with that because you get used to just writing without overthinking and I think that can be one of the killers for um any writer but particularly if you're early career or developing writer is that you want everything to be perfect and it's never going to be and definitely not in the first draft so mm -hmm. what journaling is great for is just letting you just write kind of stream of consciousness um without going back and editing it straight away which is a very uh, tempting mm -hmm. thing to use that if you are writing fiction in the same way like don't constrain yourself so much that you think it has to be perfect first time around because no no writer I can guarantee can get mm. their first draft perfect it's just it's an impossible thing yeah and I love the idea of free flow writing because I think that's maybe where the difference lies um because obviously you know those you know of us who've obviously gone through school and the education system I mean if you if you have a really great English teacher that's you know really wonderful but you know obviously things are still very prescribed you have to write in a set way or looking at a set text and you know sometimes that can be quite prescriptive and, and I think that's the most beautiful thing about free flow writing because it really is a kind of almost letting go of any inhibitions that we might have and and like you said this kind of temptation to want to edit again there's a lot of I think sometimes that um you know that that voice kicking in of like oh you're not don't make a mistake or or you need to fix if you do make a mistake you need to fix it straight away because we're kind of used to that because we're we're um especially I think for young people geared towards you know this set you know sitting exams and making sure everything's right and and I think yeah it's such a wonderful oh. way actually, if you do journal because it's not like you're handing it in for anyone to mark right it's really just for you and yourself and just getting used to um getting your thoughts on paper and I you know I think that's really um great advice you know for, for you know hopefully that there's anyone listening in or if you're a parent and carer and you want your kind of children to you know really get into writing and just kind of get used to it I mean I would probably definitely encourage um just that just just writing your thoughts down um so oh I love what you said about your imaginary pet cat though <laughs> so um you know maybe yeah maybe that's another, <laughs> that's another thing someone can do if they if they have like an imaginary friend um but just coming back a little bit about um because we, we spoke about the the festival the Luton Literature Book Festival on Saturday um obviously kind of you know trying to ensure that they, they're really diverse not just in terms of the program but you know all sorts of things you know including um accessibility the fact that you know a lot of the events are a hybrid um but you know when we talk about this idea of kind of diversity and like diversifying programs um you know the the word representation obviously also kind of um even though they're two different things tends to fall in with that um so as a writer oh. obviously you've you've been on on a journey you know we're looking forward obviously for you for you to coming on uh, to Luton on on Saturday do you think the publishing world is like taking more notice of this now and and is it adapting as it should I think the publishing industry will look at diversity every few years <laughs> this seems to be the pattern I've noted every few mm. years they'll they'll make a declaration that that it's time to make a change or that they're going to um sign on more more specifically um writers of color mm. and it, it does happen occasionally and and there's definitely far more representation than I ever saw on my bookshelf growing up so I think mm. mainly the the South Asian writers I saw when I, I would go to the library or to a bookshop when I was younger were people who were born and brought up in in India or South Asia and you didn't very very rarely did I ever see a British South Asian author apart from Mira Sayal that was the only person <laughs> I ever remember 
reason why the British Asian in the British is ridiculous because we've been in this country for, for so many decades now. Um, so that I think wasn't because, uh, which is because often the thing that I think sometimes people can say is that because we're not writing, because we are writing, it's to do with, I guess, what, what the publishing industry thinks is commercial. And I think that whole idea needs to be kind of worked with. How do we market books from people who, from different backgrounds to a wide variety of, of readers? Because we also have to think about reader bias as well. Um, mm -hmm. And will you pick up a book if it's from a, a name that you're not familiar with, that, that is from, a, from you know, um, different prejudices that sometimes people don't really realize they've got. Uh, so yeah, how can we get people to buy books from diverse writers in the same way that they would buy Richard Osmond's latest mm. book or um, those far more mainstream white authors. Um, so I think that's the thing that really needs to be tackled within the publishing industry of like really mm. thinking about how to sell us in, 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 in the same way. So this is all good and well to sign on lots of writers, but if you then drop them quite quickly mm. because they're not, um, getting the big sales that their white counterparts are, that that's really not going to have effective change. You know, and that's such a, a interesting, actually, insight, I think, that you've shared, because absolutely, you know, it's the, like you said, it, it's one thing signing, um, you know, diverse authors on. And again, the word diverse, it, again, can be, you know, <laughs> it's just like, um, it, it's a heavy yeah. word, isn't it? Because, you know, it, it carries so much to it. Um, but yeah, absolutely. Like, how do you make sure that people who will have a certain bias to pick up a book they wouldn't normally read? And, you know, it's such a an important thing yeah as you the publishing publishing industry but i guess anyone really in the literature world right so um and i guess maybe that's why the, the festival on saturday is you know really important because you know it is you know inviting authors um along who are both kind of national but also local and you know kind of inviting i guess an audience to really come and and get to know um get to know those authors in their books, you know, which again, I know we spoke about um, in the first half of the show. Um, and I guess also there's definitely something about, you know, how we can create those spaces. So, you know, a lot of listeners will know that I run a women's, uh, a, a women's book club uh, in Luton. And I think one of the best things about being part of a book club is you get to read books you wouldn't normally read. And the only way that happens is if you do have a diverse group already kind of that exists because if you already have that within your group naturally you'll have people recommending books that you know they like and then you'll be introduced to something new and you know and, and I always encourage people to and it doesn't have to be this really formal type of book club it could just be with some friends and you just get together and you know recommend books to each other and, and just yeah have a chat about them so you know I think that absolutely you know just kind of echoing everything that you've um that you've said um so maybe just a little bit more about um the festival itself but also the fact that obviously I'm going to be interviewing you on Saturday about your um novel your debut novel which is the things that we um the things we the things you know I keep why do I keep getting this mixed up in my mind but the things that we knew um so what about your second book um and a little bit of information uh, um about that so I always um kind of differentiate the two books as my first novel is about a British Bangladeshi girl growing up on a council estate in Leicester, which I then jokingly mm -hmm. say is an autobiographical, but <laughs> is kind of, um, isn't because it's a completely different person for me. I, I don't mm -hmm. think Rabin is me, but you know, that that was, um, like I say, easy to research and, uh, and a world I knew. Well, How to Find Home is about a homeless girl who goes on a uh, Wizard of Oz style adventure from Nottingham to Skegness. Um, mm. So that one I had to research and I wanted to research. I, I was always curious. We didn't have a lot of money growing up, but my mum would always give me money to give to homeless people and put, kind of push me forward <laughs> and give, mm. make me give money to people on the street. And I always found that fascinating because we didn't have a lot of money, but she she was really insistent on, on, on helping pe homeless people. 
So that made me very curious about how you could become homeless, what mm -hmm. that world might be like. And so that required a lot, a lot of research because I did not mm -hmm. want to get that wrong. I wanted to make mm -hmm. sure I'm not repeating stereotypes or, or getting that world wrong. So that was a, a very different <laughs> type of book for me because it wasn't my world. It wasn't my, my kind of, um, yeah, it wasn't the area of which I, I was really, really familiar with, but I was really um, honoured in a way to, to learn more about it and to get to know people who have been homeless or are homeless. Yeah, and, it, and I guess it, it really touches upon the fact that in you know, both your novels, you do kind of um, tackle, yeah, important issues that maybe not everyone would obviously be familiar with, or we have like a really biased, um, maybe, uh, kind of thoughts I guess in terms of you know uh, like you said people who are homeless who are unhoused and actually how all of that can happen in the context of that um, so do you think like writers have a responsibility um, to, to inform readers of social issues like that is that kind of how you feel is that how you approach your writing or is it basically you know, just what interests you and then obviously you, you kind of write about that It is more the second. So I always go with what I'm personally interested and curious about. I think it, it's a bit, it would be a big ask to ask every writer to to, to bring up social issues or mm. or feel like they have to because it's, it's you get different books for different people. But mm. I have always been interested in the voices we don't hear as much from, um, especially in literature, especially as a person who came from a very particular background that I never really saw represented in books, being working class, being British Bangladeshi, um, never saw that in, in literature. So I am really curious about those those worlds, but also about breaking the stereotypes. So living on a council estate, there's a lot of stereotypes about what type of people live there and kind of myths about gangs and drugs and I'm not saying that 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 doesn't happen, but it happens throughout the country and it doesn't just happen on council estate. It's you mm. also get a lot of joy and happiness and community. Um, and with homelessness, the same thing. I think there's a, a, a lot of preconceptions about homeless people, but there's so many different types of homelessness. There's people who do, who sofa surf, so technically have a roof on their, over their heads, but don't have a permanent address. There's people who who go to work, but and then go and sleep in their cars. So it's it's who look very much like every other person you'd see on the street, and you wouldn't know that they were homeless. So it was it yeah. That's what I'm really interested in is is looking at beyond those stereotypes. What is it really like? And the, mm -hmm. again, the light and shade of of life in all its different forms. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, you know, you're, you're absolutely right. I think, you know, writers naturally, yeah, it's it's kind of, I guess, what um, brings, what comes to your attention. And then obviously you use your writing to, yeah, just share something with the reader. And I think that's obviously always the essence of, of why, um, I guess, people pick up, you know, particular books or, you know, with particular themes. Or again, like we just said, that if they're new, you know, being introduced to a new author or a new book, I think it's a really wonderful way of, of just being able to, you know, delve into a completely different world and really learn from it. And I guess, yeah, absolutely, the onus is really from the the reader and uh, again the beauty of, of reading being that you you know to an extent it helps increase empathy you know I would hope anyway for, for most people um so we've got like a couple of minutes left and um obviously the main crux of, of today's um show has also been about the fact that obviously Luton Literary Book Festival is taking place um on Saturday 9th of November um so we've mentioned obviously there's there's lots more you know taking place you can find out more information on um the website which is www.lutonetliterature.co.uk. Tickets can be booked um, via the Culture Trust. So the website is www.culturetrust.com. Um, so, you know, there's a massive, you know, lineup. So like you've said, we have four author events in Masuda, 
is obviously one of them. I have the pleasure of interviewing Masuda, but obviously in person, which will be fantastic about her book, um, Things uh, We Thought We Knew. And um, there's also, we're going to be joined by Michael Stewart, Jasmine Elmer and Eva Verde. Um, the children's programme is also jam-packed. Um, you've got Shana Jackson, who is the author of High Rise Mystery Series, um, Adiola Sukumbi, who is the author of Destiny Inc. and she's also an illustrator. You've got uh, Sophia Ahmed, who's written the Rosie Raja stories, and um, Steve Cole, who has been involved in the Doctor Who stories. So amazing, amazing um, lineup for um, younger people um, to, to go um, two and for children there's a free story telling sessions um, with Aaron Spendler who is a local an absolutely wonderful local creative you've got craft sessions with Mary Hearn and you've got creative writing workshop with Lockett and Wild creator Lucy Strange uh, which is suitable for 10 to 12 year olds and you also have a creative writing workshop with Blob Fish creator um Olaf Falafel, uh, which is suitable for four to 11 year olds. So there's lots happening. I may have missed some because there's so much. But again, like I said, you can um, visit the Luton Literature um, website to get more information. Um, do you have any final words, um, Masuda, just before we end? I think we might have about 30 seconds. Thank you for listening to our podcast. Why not tune in to our live stream at inspirefm.org? And follow and subscribe to our social media platforms at InspireFM Luton.